I want to talk about work. Consider the implications of our ordinary terminology in which we call a thing a work of art. That's because it has work bound into it. Labor makes it. It doesn't spring into being like Athena from the head of Zeus. Any art requires the diligent application of attention and effort. Nobody's been able to cut out the labor, although in some instances artists can have others do the physical part for them. Even the conceptualists, who claimed that the thinking, not the making, was the essence of art, still had to do that thinking and had to render it in some perceptible form, at least putting it down on paper in words. No one got away with claiming that thinking alone was significant without sharing the thought in some form. Even now, in our vaunted virtual age, somebody has to spend a huge amount of time making a program or inputting instructions. This contemporary form of labor doesn't make you sweat, and it doesn't require manual skill, but computers and video cameras don't eliminate the need for labor, they just change its form. I'm going to concentrate tonight not on this standard level of labor, which is present in all works of art, but on visible labor, especially when it seems to be excessive, and on works of art in which the labor itself is specifically part of the meaning for the viewer and part of the worth of the work for the artist. This includes some outsider art, some therapeutic exercises, some spiritual devotions, some works of craft, and also a lot of mainstream art straight out of the galleries. Many artists today pour themselves into the labor of making as if that part were the essence. Impediments like lack of money or recognition won't stop such artists because the activity itself is rewarding to them. This has come to my attention because I'm interested in contemporary crafts ceramics, textiles, jewelry, etc. And excessive labor is one of the accusations sometimes made against crafts, as if that were a flaw. But I observed the same phenomenon in contemporary art, which set me to thinking about what it means. My point of view here is not as a scholar or a physiologist of labor or a psychologist, but as a critic, that is, a person who looks at art carefully and tries to understand it based on ordinary knowledge and ordinary experience. And from this non-expert point of view, I'll speculate that work is meaningful today precisely because we live in a time and a culture of such extremely developed division of labor and specialization. We are vulnerable to the complexity of our systems. Who really understands how the internet works and where that information that we save is actually? How many of us could fix a car or a telephone or even a bicycle? We go through our days in faith and hope and trust that all these things will work. But many artists, it seems to me, to some degree compensate for our modern disconnectedness by engaging in an understandable process, in a specific physical activity, by applying themselves in concrete terms of strenuous or time-consuming effort that is shareable because it's visible in the end product. The spiritual benefit of intensely focused activity can also be pantheistic or nature-centered. One means is to follow the cycles of nature in gathering materials. Artist Wolfgang Leib is exemplary in this regard. Instead of buying some materials at an art supply house, he seasonally spends lengthy periods of time in the fields around his home in southern Germany gathering hazelnut pollen. He sifts it softly onto a gallery floor like a reclining Rothko painting with its aura, as in this uh, 1986 piece, or he piles it into a big cone on the floor or a small cone in a niche, as in this 98 work, which was shown at Spironi Westwater Gallery in New York. Uh, the English artist Anish Kapoor has also used dry pigment in a rather similar fashion and with the same kind of impact. So one might suppose that how Leib gathers this material is extra visual. Except that, in experience, it tends to be such amazing golden stuff that you wonder what it is, and when you find out it's pollen, you wonder where someone gets pollen. Kapoor can get his pigment at a supply store. The knowledge of Leib's process gives a greater dimension to his work by investing it with the preciousness of time. 
Leib's other works deal equally with uh, uh, elemental substances such as rice and wax and milk, but they don't have quite the same time labor association except that his milk stones require replenishing, replenishing of the milk within them by gallery personnel, someone else's labor rather than his own. Artists who use basketry materials such as John McQueen may also follow this seasonal schedule. The time involved here is not entranced or lost time, but simply time as determined by nature, not by man. It depends on your frame of mind. McQueen has said, art can't come from art, only from life. So process makes a difference. This statement places him in a certain context. It's not something that Sherry Levine or the other appropriationists would have said, for instance. At one point, McQueen used only the materials available on eight acres of land that he owned in western New York. Elm bark, white pine, cherry bark, grapevine, and burrs, for example. Baskets are about organization and also about the mythology of materials, but they're also about time and labor because the structure, particularly in interlaced ones, which this is not an example of, of course, um, uh, the, the uh, structure, like gesture in Pollock's abstraction, is unconcealed. McQueen's techniques are not influenced by modern industrial notions of speed or efficiency, so you have to ask yourself why someone would do it. Jackson Pollock's stains of paint are sometimes applied so individually that one can follow a line deep into the painterly space, and this elicits specific thinking about the making of the painting. You see its history of existence. The web of lines is at once image and structure and process. Other kinds of art that might take just as much or more time, such as photorealistic painting, do not so visibly present their process. We may know in our heads that such skilled and controlled work must take a lot of time, but what we see is a smoothly finished image, a surface closed off to the evidence of making. Jumping a decade or two from abstract expressionism, I think another significant precedent for labor-intensive work today is process art, also called anti-form or the broader term post-minimalism, including the work of such artists as Linda Benglis, Eva Hesse, Jackie Windsor, whose work you see here, Barry LeVay, Bruce Nauman, Joel Shapiro, Richard Tuttle, Richard Serra. All of this work gives evidence, in the words of Jackie Windsor, of, quote, the physicalness of what the artist was doing. Sometimes that's something quick, as when Richard Serra threw molten lead into corners or Barry LeVay scattered bits of felt or shards of glass. And sometimes it was slow, as when, in this work, Jackie Windsor made a number of bound pieces using rope that she had unraveled. These pieces, like most of her work, can be grasped quickly in an overall impression of form, but when you look carefully, you can see how slow it must have been wrapping and wrapping and wrapping cord around the intersections of four logs, executing the most rudimentary of activities, which she says, gives the, she believes, gives the work the potential energy of a sleeping person. In another work that I'm not illustrating, Windsor joined two seven-foot planks of wood together by hammering nails into them, top and bottom, until she couldn't fit any more in, and then repeating the process until she had nine planks stacked up. It was, by any measure of efficiency, colossal overkill. More than 4,000 nails can be counted in the top and bottom surface, which are the only ones visible. The piece is equally wood and nails. <laughs> 